And just to prove that quantum entanglement is true, the next performer is Keith's supervisor. And I asked him, how did you come to be, you know, get involved? What inspired you to, to, to talk about physics? And he went, I'm, I'm not really sure how I came to be here. So there you go. It was Keith's influence brought Peter Rohde to us. And aren't we all the better for it? Hooray! Thanks very much and thanks for organising the evening. My, my girlfriend couldn't come tonight and I promised her I wouldn't drink, so... So, yeah. Um, that was my student, Keith. He's uh, in his second year of his PhD and he's doing a fantastic job. I'm basically going to present exactly the same material and claim credit for it because I'm his supervisor. So, what I'd like to talk to you about tonight is quantum technology. We've heard all about quantum physics tonight. I'd like to tell you about the incredible things that we can do with it and also dispel some myths about what we can't do with it because there are lots of ideas out there that are just patently false. So let's start with the beginning. We've heard about superpositions a few times tonight. Let's take a look at what a superposition is. So we all live in what's called the classical or Newtonian world of physics where every object has a well-defined position and a well-defined velocity and a well-defined everything else. Now in quantum physics, things can have uncertainty, they can be in superpositions. So an atom can be here and here at the same time, or can be moving this way and this way at the same time, and that's called a superposition. And in quantum mechanics, any object can be in a superposition. So you might say, well, why don't we see it? How come when I look at you, sir, you're just sitting there? I don't see you over there and over there, you're just sitting right there. The reason that that is the case is because of a phenomenon in quantum mechanics called decoherence. And that is that when uh, objects interact with the environment around them, the superposition collapses onto one particular value or another. So we never actually see superpositions, even though we know that they're there. And we do know that they're there. I don't have the time to prove it to you, but I can, you can take my word for it, that there are countless experiments out there that can prove unequivocally that superpositions are very, very real. Because we can do interference experiments where we take an object, put it into a superposition of two places, and watch the way they interact with the environment, proving that a superposition is really taking place, even though we can't see the superposition. So uh, let's get on to this Schrodinger cat business that we've heard a few times tonight. We take an atom, we put it here and here at the same time. We put it in a box with a cat and then we couple the atom with the cat in such a way that if the, cat, if the atom is here, the cat stays alive and if the atom is over here, the cat gets killed. Now, I approached my university to see whether we could do this experiment, and they said, well, we, we spoke to the RSPCA about it, and we couldn't get approval to do that experiment. So we'll never actually have definitive proof to answer the question, is Schrodinger's cat real? But to the best of our knowledge, uh, the answer is yes. If we have a well-isolated cat which doesn't interact with its environment, so it doesn't decohere, to the best of our understanding of quantum physics, that cat can be in a superposition of dead and alive. So let's talk about computing. That's, that's where it gets really interesting. We, we all know about classical computers. You have bits of information, electrical signals, that are either zeros or ones. Let's imagine that our bit is now a quantum bit, and it can be in a superposition of zero and one at the same time. So we have one bit, and it's zero and one. If we have two bits, it can be zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one, four combinations all at once. If we have three bits, there are eight combinations. If we have 100 bits, there are two to the power of 100 combinations, all existing at the same time. Now, a quantum computer is a device which allows us to process these superpositions. So a common misconception is that a quantum computer is this massively parallel supercomputer that gives us the answer to everything at once. We have 100 bits of information, we put it into a superposition of everything at once, process it through our computer, and hey presto, we get the answer to two to the power of 100 problems all at once. And that sounds too good to be true, and it is. Would anyone like to suggest why it's too good to be true? I can't see, but there's an attractive young lady up the front here. <laughs> why can't we see the answer to two of the 100 problems at once? It's because of decoherence. If we look at the output superposition of our computer, we don't see two to the power of 100 answers. It collapses, and we just see one answer. So we, we put in this input state that has two to the power of 100 combinations. It does all of this internal processing. We measure it at the output and we just get one answer. 
So you might think, well, quantum computers are useless. What do we actually use them for? We measure the output and it just gives us the answer to one solution. That's what a normal computer does too. Well, the beauty of a quantum computer is that we can use certain tricks that even though we can't get the answer to two to the power of 100 problems at once, what we can do is extract general properties of all two to the 100 at the same time. The best known algorithm uh, for quantum computers is called Grover's search algorithm. And it works like this. If I give you a telephone book and I say, find my name, Peter Rohde, it's a trivial thing to do because the telephone book is ordered alphabetically. You just open up the page R and there's my name. But if I inverted the question and said, find my phone number in the book, 0404-15226, you wouldn't have a clue how to find it. It's not ordered by a number. So the best you could do is start at the beginning and just work your way through the book. And if there are a million pages uh, in the book, on average, you'd have to search through 500,000 pages on average to find my number. So that's a very computationally intensive thing to do. So if you have n elements in a database which isn't ordered, on average you have to do n divided by two queries to the database to find the number that you're looking for. But what Grover showed was that there's a quantum algorithm that lets us do it in the square root of n numbers. So if I have a database with one million entries, on a classical computer it would take on average 500,000 searches to find the entry you're looking for. On a quantum computer, it would only take the square root of one million, which is 1,000 uh, search items. So there's an enormous computational advantage to doing this quantum mechanically. It doesn't give us the answer to the whole phone book, but it tells us a general property of the phone book, which is the location of the entry that we're looking for in the book. And that's the power of quantum computers. There are other algorithms that are even more powerful. There are certain code-breaking algorithms that would allow us to invalidate all of the internet security that we use today, all based on these quantum principles. So I hope I've given you some inspiration that these kinds of technologies are worth investing in. There are many other quantum technologies apart from quantum computing that are exciting. Using quantum mechanics, we can build provably uncrackable codes. So if you want to make yourself safe against the NSA and against hackers, there are quantum cryptographic algorithms that allow us to communicate securely and there's literally nothing that anyone can do, no matter how powerful their computers, that will allow them to read your emails. We can also do measurements using quantum physics. Uh, many orders of magnitude more precise than what the best classical devices let us do. So there are many, many reasons to be excited by the future of quantum technology. My favorite is quantum computing, but there are many, many, many others. And this is why we should be investing more money into quantum physics. And that's my spiel. Please give me more research money. Thank you very much. Peter Rohde is provably uncrackable. I love it.